on its 40th and 50th um, anniversary. But before I introduce the film, I want to introduce Georgette. Hi, and this is Renee Simon. She can sing too. Mm -hmm. So let's give her a round of applause. My name is Georgette Berkey, and I'm the executive director of Eastville Community Historical Society. Um, you can give me a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have many of my board members here. I saw my board um, president. Chair um, Audrey Gaines in the back. I also see Abel Gornick in the front. I saw Michael Butler. I saw Maureen Cunningham, past board member of Gloria um, Fred Brown here. And if there's any other I from City, please just raise your hand. I want to acknowledge you. Um, and I saw many other important people that we have here today. I want to acknowledge um, uh, Julian Adams from the State Office of Historic Preservation. He is the Bureau. Um, the division Chief, could you raise your hand? Um, I also want to acknowledge Dr. Allison McGovern, who did the survey for SANS. Could you raise your hand? I want to also acknowledge um, uh, the Director of Preservation for Preservation Long Island. We have Sarah Kautz here. Please raise your hand. Um, that is being put forth by many people and also many of the SANS steering committee of people that are here today. Uh, let's, Could uh, they stand? And yes. Yes. You know, this happened because uh, the village of uh, Sack Harbor said, I love the idea, but you have to self-fund any historic survey, etc. Um, so uh, those may not know the, the uh, uh, group called Com Comus, but at the Comus Affair, Debbie Jackson, are you, I know you're in the audience, could you raise your hand and stand up? Oh, okay, but well, Debbie Jackson Mel is here, her husband, her husband. And I walked around there and asked, can you give $1,000? Can you give $1,000? And people said yes, and through that, we were able to raise money to do this survey. And then we asked steering committee to do, the steering committee to do oral histories, et cetera, and, uh, and they walked around, took pictures, they did all kinds of things. Could the steering committee, anyone who did anything for us to make today happen, <laughs> stand please? You know who you are, there has to be at least 25 We also, for those who may not realize, also fielded a uh, petition, and we got 51% of all three uh, subdivisions to petition that we do pursue landmarking and we have 306 houses so you know what it is to get handwritten signed petitions of 51 percent of them and we did that too so with that I don't not to belabor anymore I do want to thank everyone again for being here we do have Andrea and uh, Andrew why don't you come on this side you can see all my stuff <laughs> and uh, we're going to uh, uh, roll this oh before I, I didn't do an adequate job of this Georgia has been a partner from the very beginning. And I would be remiss if I didn't really personally thank you. Oh. It would not have been as fast and furious if it were not for Georgette stirring us on. I, I would say to her, when I speak to her, I hate talking to her and I love talking to her. Um, I love talking to her because she inspires me and we, we, you know, she knows the area. She's the expert. I'm a business person. I can run some mean P&Ls and run a billion dollar business, but I know nothing about landmarking or anything like that. She, on the other hand, knows everything about it. And so I really appreciated the fact that she guided me through this process. So with that, let me introduce this um, again. Uh, this is a, a video we thought that you'd find it very interesting. It runs about 15 minutes. After that, uh, we will then introduce Andrew, who will then take us through some historic information. So thank you.
college, but to consummate a professional job here now. It's amazing. We have quite a few attorneys. And I only really say this only because, of course, this adds to the San Carlos Legal Association. These are people who know the law. These are people who know how to carry things through, who have great organizational skills. So to have these young people, let's say young people, we're talking people in their 30s and 40s, <laughs> coming up, using their education, their profession, for the betterment of the community. I think there's no better way to do it than that way. Using their talents to come and improve the area. And uh, our new president, Barbara North, is a young attorney who uh, is making some strides here. I think it's very exciting to see. And there's a sense of a continuum. Well, all I can say is that many, many, many years of happiness to say I can say happy 40th anniversary. And hopefully I will live to see the next boys with the new medication in the background. What can I say? It's not a to all of us. actually keeps that as a uh, family property. So with that, um, at this point, I'd like to turn the mic, and uh, Georgette joins me in that, to Mr. Andrew Call, uh, who, uh, let me give you a little back on how we got there. April, you should stand and wave too. Um, about two plus years ago, uh, we were talking about what was happening to Sands, and uh, we had a book, um, I believe, Bill may have passed the book to me called The Land Was Ours. And with that, um, we were looking at and talking to the village about what could be done to preserve the area because we thought it was worthy of preservation. And I remember April feeling strongly about getting more advocates out there and with the book, actually made the call to Andrew to get Andrew involved. Andrew actually wrote a, a very um, uh, touching and supportive letter um, on our behalf. And that kind of st stood there maybe a couple of years already. And then this year, we were looking at how we could have another information session. And we thought that if 
and I should say applaud us, we were just um, told a couple of weeks ago that SANS, meaning all three subdivisions in its entirety, um, are, that we are eligible for national and state historic districts. So. To uh, share why, why is it so important? What, what is what is Sands and what it is Sand for? You saw a little bit of the past, and then I remembered the book, and I remember that Andrew is uh, by far uh, one of the known authorities on uh, beach resort areas, historically black areas, African American areas, and I, I reached out, never knowing that he would one say yes, and then two be available. And we were so blessed to have him. So I'd like to introduce Andrew, who will kick us off and tell us. To be here uh, and to really have a chance to spend some time, more importantly, in the community. Uh, I want to thank, in addition to Renee for inviting me, I want to thank um, Alan Beverly Granger for hosting our family here the last two days. And uh, it's really given me a sense as well of the, the warmth of the community and really reinforces much of what we just saw here a moment ago about how important it is to um, both cherish protect and be vigilant in preserving um, what has grown up here over many decades. I also want to thank the uh, Eastville Community Historical Society as well for hosting this event. And my, my goal this afternoon is to really put some of what's been happening here in Sag Harbor in a historical context. Um, and really, if, if, in order to understand, I believe, the importance of Black Beach Resorts in African American life, we first need to look at the Jim Crow world that made them so necessary. You know, if there's, if there's a seasonality to segregation, it's safe to say that summers were America's most segregated season. No more so than in places where people went for leisure and recreation, like beaches. You know, at the beginning of the early 20th century, as more and more Americans flock to shorelines for leisure and recreation during the summer months. White officials uh, increasingly drew racial color lines in the water and violently policed those boundaries in places of play. Uh, one of the nation's bloodiest race riots began uh, over a dispute over access to a beach in Chicago in the summer of 1919 when a black teenager named Eugene Williams accidentally drifted across an invisible color line in the water into an area that had been claimed by the city's Irish population. White gang members began pelting the child with rocks. One struck him in the head and Williams drowned. Violence ensued, lasting seven days and claiming 38 lives. It was very much a preview of things to come in the racially fraught cities that experienced waves of African American migrants in the early 20th century. But it was also characteristic of the ways in which race acquired a sort of spatiality along shorelines and how exclusion of African Americans became a defining feature of um, coastal areas. You know, in coastal cities like Norfolk, Virginia, Charleston, South Carolina, and Miami, Florida, cities with large African American populations, white officials prohibited African Americans from stepping foot on any of its public beaches and for years ignored African Americans' demands for public beaches of their own. Up here in the more liberal Northeast, um, which is the subject of my new book, Free the Beaches, um, whites employed more subtle but no less effective methods of segregation. Predominantly white suburbs and towns oftentimes designated their beaches for residents only. Um, these are also communities that should be mentioned that excluded African Americans from being able to live in these communities through a variety of exclusionary devices. Um, and then oftentimes, um, you know, either sort of did other sort of more subtle techniques such as charging exorbitant access fees for non-residents um, or uh, barring non-residents from being able to park near the shore, all designed in various ways to keep minority populations in neighboring cities out. You know, many African Americans who grew up in the Northeast uh, discovered uh, Jim Crow or first encountered it uh, along shorelines. People such as the Harlem Renaissance novelist Ann Petrie, who um, first sort of encountered racial discrimination at an early age as a child on a beach in Connecticut. Uh, she came there with a Sunday school group to a picnic. She was the only African American child in the group. Previously, 
the Sunday school group had never had any problems with using this stretch of shoreline. But when there was a young black girl in the group, suddenly a security guard showed up, ordered them off the shore, claiming that it was a private beach. She later wrote that the Sunday school group was forced to go and eat, enjoy their picnic on the church lawn, and they ate, as she said, in clammy silence. Constance Baker Motley, the future civil rights lawyer, politician, and judge who grew up in New Haven, Connecticut in the 1930s, also encountered segregation in the North for the first time on a beach. This time when she accompanied two white friends to a beach in the town of Milford, Connecticut. The white girls who she accompanied went there often and had never had any problems getting in. But when the African-American Motley was with the group, however, there was suddenly a membership requirement. <laughs> you know, resort areas and second home markets also ruthlessly excluded people of color through deed restrictions and private membership requirements. Uh, in Connecticut, there was hundreds of these private beach associations, all of whom adopted racial covenants, uh, which forbade the sale of lots to Negroes and other disfavored minorities. Private clubs also wrote bans on black membership into their bylaws. And these legal tools often, these legal tools of exclusion often complemented and reinforced each other. Take the case of William Philpop, an African American minister from Harlem, who succeeded in purchasing a waterfront cottage on Andover Lake in Connecticut in 1955, using a straw buyer in this instance. But for the next 12 years, he was prevented from enjoying the lake that fronted the family's home. That's because the lake was for members of the Andover Lake Property Owners Association only. And the Property Owners Association refused to grant Philpott membership. But this sordid history of segregation and exclusion is only one part of the story of race along America's shorelines. For in the face of white racism, African Americans doggedly pursued places of their own. And throughout the first half of the 20th century, across the US, African Americans developed and defended their own separate leisure spaces and resort communities. Hundreds of these are scattered throughout the country, some along the Atlantic coast, uh, many of them tucked along rivers and lakes in the interior. These were places where African Americans can enjoy their fleeting moments of leisure and dignity and on their own terms, places where they could get a rest from white racism. These were not accommodations to the world of Jim Crow. They were a defiance of it. They were seeking to transcend the world that whites have created. You know, the story of African American beach resorts is, as I believe, the story of enterprising black men and women who work to build profitable seasonal enterprises that could cater to a segregated black public. It's the story of farming families who turn their sandy acreage into summertime resorts. It's the story of upper class black professionals who built private exclusive summer resorts for our own kind of people, to borrow a phrase from the book by Lawrence Otis Graham. It's the story of black preachers and social reformers who worked to acquire and develop beachfront properties where the race could relax, retreat, and recuperate. It's the story of working mothers and grassroots activists who fought tirelessly for cities to provide black citizens with decent and safe places where their children could swim, families could picnic, and communities could gather. It's the story of people who built homes with no help from banks, no help from public officials, without any of the advantages that white Americans enjoy. Instead, we're forced to rely upon their own ingenuity, determination, sweat equity, putting into their properties. You know, the type and variety of black beach resorts really reflected the diversity of black America itself, from religious campgrounds where secular amusements were banned, to commercial establishments where some of the most celebrated jazz and R&B artists first got their start from exclusive communities for members of the black elite to places where working families could go for a summer afternoon and for a moment lay their burdens down. One thing though that they all had in common was ownership of the land and the sense of autonomy and independence that that provided. You know, land ownership was, 
central to black visions of freedom after slavery. And despite the broken promises of reconstruction, of 40 acres and a mule that were never delivered, African Americans' belief in the promise of land ownership didn't die, and in fact grew stronger. Now, as African Americans were stripped of their civil rights and denied equal protection under the law, and told by the Supreme Court that separate was equal, they strove harder than ever to acquire property. You know, this chart here kind of shows, in a sense, almost an inverse relationship between the erosion of African American civil rights and their determined efforts to acquire land and assert their property rights. You know, black land ownership in America rose most dramatically during the same decades that the nation descended into Jim Crow, or as the historian Rayford Logan called it, the nadir of black life in America. African Americans of this generation vested land ownership and efforts at political independence with an almost mystical quality as providing a shelter in the storm. The number of acres in African Americans' possession and the growth and proliferation of independent black communities became, in a sense, a barometer of the race's progress, a measure of their strides toward equality, and more importantly, of their physical security and autonomy from Jim Crow. This was the context in which many of the Black Beach resorts that I write about in my book, The Land Was Ours, first came about. In many respects, they oftentimes were building on this tradition and often, um, quite literally, acquiring land that had been first acquired by African Americans in the decades following emancipation. Places like Highland Beach in Maryland, located on the Chesapeake Bay, just south of Annapolis. By some measures, it was the first black beach resort in America, founded in 1893 by Charles Douglas, the son of Frederick Douglas. Founded after Douglas and his wife were denied entry at a white resort nearby. They found, shortly thereafter, an African American farmer who owned 40 acres of, of property along the Chesapeake, who sold that land to them and became the basis for this summer resort community, where property owners sought freedom from the sting of prejudice and worked to create and protect a space that reflected their tastes and sense of status and sensibilities. These were places where a select set of black professionals, doctors, lawyers, professors, socialized together, where their children met, played, many later married, and where an exclusive branch of black America began to grow. Other African Americans sought out the sea as a form of spiritual communion. Along the Gulf of Mexico, from Mississippi, black Methodists acquired nearly 400 acres of oceanfront property in 1923. And there founded the first religious campground and seaside resort for African Americans in the South. They named it Gulfside. There, the families rented rooms in a spacious mansion. Religious leaders played host to summer camps for children from the city and vocational schools for at-risk youth. For many African Americans at the time, just being able to see the ocean was almost an otherworldly experience. It was just like being in heaven, as one person put it. When you got on Gulf Sides grounds, your whole everything changed. It was truly a spiritually uplifting place. Gulfside was guided by the belief that the beautiful grounds, the waters of the Gulf, would give its visitors an entirely new outlook on life. It would give them strength to overcome the vicious racism of life in Mississippi under Jim Crow. And indeed, Gulfside would later play a key role in helping to organize and sustain the civil rights movement in Mississippi in the 50s and 60s. You know, by the 1940s, we're really beginning to see a proliferation of Black Beach resorts across America, including Sag Harbor, founded in that post-war era. 
And oftentimes these places were the brainchild of black farming families who would own the land for generations. Places like Carr's Beach, located outside of Annapolis, Maryland. The land there had been owned by a family that had acquired the nearly 200 acres at the turn of the century. And beginning in the 1920s, began running a boarding house for summer travelers and hosting church groups and social clubs on the family's beach. It quickly became a popular draw for African Americans from Baltimore and DC. Soon, Cars Beach was hosting beauty contests and musical acts. Entire neighborhoods from nearby cities boarded buses and spent weekends there. You know, the owners of these types of resorts were responding to a demand. There was nowhere else where African Americans could safely go in the summer to cool off, to go on a family outing, to take someone on a date. And so doing, these beach resorts helped form the nexus of a burgeoning black entertainment industry. James Brown performed here, Otis Redding, Jackie Wilson. They were hosting shows and booking artists from across the country who were coming to this resort and, and sort of helping to sort of build a black popular culture in America. You know, these beaches became oftentimes a sort of magnet for a variety of different entrepreneurial activities. Carnival games, fortune tellers, snake handlers, people turning their homes into dew drop ins, or <laughs> turning their kitchens into food stands. People who are putting their talents and interests to use People were trying to find a way to make it as a black person in a white world. And they often did so in the face of the numerous, uh, numerous obstacles and hazards. You know, it's important to remember that Jim Crow was, first and foremost, a system of economic exploitation, one that was made possible by political domination and social ostracism. And if there was ever a way to make money off of black people, you could be sure a white man was there to try it. You know, black beach resorts, and amusement parks and outdoor places of leisure were no different. You know, as I write about in my book, you know, savvy white businessmen were always trying to capitalize off of black demand for outdoor leisure and entertainment by opening their own beach resorts that catered to black people. And oftentimes trying to snuff out competition from black business owners or dispossess black people of their property, especially when white or when black resorts became a threat to white property, or when black land became desirable to white buyers. You know, the threat, the threat of white sabotage cast a shadow over these independent black land development and commercial ventures. These places were under a constant threat from local officials who often deliberately raised their property taxes or rezoned their land or use the power of eminent domain to take and repurpose their property. And they faced threat from their white neighbors. And many of the places I profile in my book were the subject of arson attacks and concerted efforts by whites to drive them off the land. You know that beautiful mansion that I showed on Gulf and Gulf side, the Mississippi Gulf Coast, burned to the ground in 1926. Local officials never bothered to investigate the circumstances behind it. And the people at Gulfside, in a sense, sort of knew that that threat was always there. They picked up and persevered. But nevertheless, this was a constant threat that many of these places faced. You know, many of the places I write about were sort of, in a sense, sort of oftentimes lost to time because they never were even given a chance to flourish. Places like Shell Island Beach Resort here in this postcard. You know, this place was founded in the 1920s by a group of black doctors, lawyers, and ministers who purchased this barrier island and began work on a high-class vacation resort, which for a few years was attracting African Americans from as far away as Harlem, who came down there to see and to enjoy this very elusive space. But after three, after three years, and a series of arson attacks, the investors were forced to cut their losses and abandon the property. In Norfolk in 1920s, a black waterfront landowner opened his stretch of shore to African Americans during the spring and summer 
again, trying to meet a need that the city was denying to its black population. It was the only stretch of shore in the entire city, a city that was virtually surrounded by water that was available to African Americans. But within two years of its opening, it too burned to the ground. And when a group of black investors attempted to rebuild it and reopen it, white neighbors succeeded in getting the city's zoning board to deny them a permit. And when a separate group of black investors attempted to purchase an undeveloped section of beachfront property in another part of the city, the city scrambled to acquire it for themselves, so as in their words, to keep it from falling into the hands of colored people. You know, invariably, many of these beach resorts came under attack when the land was seen as valuable. And in the decades following World War II, coastal real estate went from being some of the cheapest and most readily available land in the country to some of the most expensive and coveted. This was the result of infrastructure development and advances in civil engineering that allowed for roads to be built and for wild shores to be tamed, all of which was heavily subsidized by states and the federal government, which funded massive coastal engineering projects and later got into the business of subsidizing flood insurance. And in removing many of the obstacles to capital investment in coastal areas, with these new advances, there was some seemingly no limits upon the potential to develop along shorelines, oftentimes in ways that were reckless to the environment and damaging to the people who had lived there for generations. By the late 1960s, over 20,000 acres of fragile coastal wetlands were being lost each year to development. From Florida to Texas, um, from the Atlantic coast down, coastal counties saw their seasonal and year-round populations increase dramatically during these decades. And coastal real estate development became a booming industry. And as it did, African American summer communities and small coastal landowners in general became targets for removal by speculators who are looking to buy and flip properties for massive profits, and by developers who are looking to build resorts, hotels, timeshares, and golf courses. You know, the growth of coastal real estate coincided with the victories of the civil rights movement. You know, at the very moment when many of these places were struggling to attract a younger generation, commercial establishments like Cars Beach which, again, sometimes drew large crowds. Over 50,000 people once showed up to a show by Chuck Berry there. Um, saw in the, deck, in the years following desegregation, saw its attendance figures drop sharply as black musicians moved into the mainstream and performed on larger stages. And as black consumers gained access to previously segregated places of amusement. Cars Beach, for example, you know, they, after attempting several makeovers, eventually was forced to close in 1973. At Gulfside in Mississippi, white officials in the Methodist Church slashed annual appropriations to the resort and attempted to sell off the land following the church's integration in 1964. There, black Methodists had to wage an 11th hour fight to save the historic campgrounds which they succeeded in doing, but in the decades that followed, funding for the resort plummeted and Gulfside became, as one longtime member put it, it was left to flounder. Exclusive summer resort communities like Highland Beach in Maryland struggled to remain viable as a younger generation ventured off to vacation destinations that had been closed to their parents. As longtime resident Ray Langston told me, after integration, this was the last place in the world our kids wanted to go. They'd been coming here since they were children. And previously, all the areas surrounding the venerable Highland Beach had been populated with African American families who had in the decades after its founding established sister communities like Venice Beach and Bay Highlands. But one by one, these families sold their homes oftentimes to 
wealthy whites or deep-pocketed developers, people who are no longer turned off by the prospect of living next to well or new black families, but who are oftentimes more interested in tearing down and replacing the homes, often replacing them with garish, oversized mansions, seem very out of place, and had very little interest often in, in being a part of the community that had been there for generations. This also had another effect on the ability of Black Beach Resort communities to sustain themselves, because as you began to see houses torn down and replaced with larger homes, as you began to see property values go through the roof, so too did property taxes. Um, in Highland, in the area around Highland Beach, many homeowners found property assessments increasing by as much as a thousand percent in a single year. Mm. This, of course, forced many families to sell. Mm. I feel like I'm being strangled, one Highland Beach resident told a reporter as they drove past rows of new multi-story homes or small cottages and woods had once stood. Others felt like they had been robbed. You know, the rapid appreciation of coastal real estate gave rise to all forms of chicanery and legalized theft, often targeted at the most vulnerable, and often tailored to exploit their weaknesses and liabilities. You know, in many booming markets, it was common for local taxing officials to deliberately overassess the value of black owned land or force families into tax delinquency and sell their land at a tax auction, where then a class of professional tax lien investors could make a fortune buying up valuable property for pennies on the dollar. This was the case especially in places like Hilton Head, South Carolina, a place that before the 1950s was entirely black owned and occupied for children who grew up without ever seeing a white face. And then suddenly, following the completion of a bridge, the acquisition of a substantial portion of the property by a developer who began building what were known as plantation resorts, um, soon taxes on all neighboring areas began to go through the roof. And as I sort of looked at closely, you know, I found that these tax sales were really sort of a, um, instrumental in this rapid turnover of who lived there and how the land was used. Um, very much sort of playing a role in what we see today, an island where very few African Americans remain, um, one that is virtually unrecognizable to those who grew up there a few generations ago. You know, another instrument of black dispossession, which I write about in my first book, That the Land Was Ours, was the forced partition sale. Now this is a sort of a unique, sort of uniquely tailored to exploit the historical legacy of Jim Crow. In particular, African Americans' reluctance to leave wills or to, or to enter probate courts. It was quite common throughout the South, especially for African American landowners to die without leaving a will. And when they did, their property fell to their descendants in the form of undivided shares. These became known as heirs' property, a highly unstable and uniquely vulnerable form of land tenure. That's because if a speculator wanted to force that land onto the market, all he had to do was find a living descendant of that original owner and convince him or her to sell them their share in the land. Since families were often far flung, and many of them having no direct ties to the land or family members who were living on it, this was often not hard. And once these so-called share hunters acquired a share, they could force the courts to put the entire property up for sale, often against the family's wishes. And at these sales, developers easily outbid family members who were then left to divide the proceeds of the sale, often among hundreds of descendants. You know, tax sales and partition sales were, were just two of the many tools used by developers to uproot coastal black communities and pocket the wealth 
that lay buried in that sandy soil. And rather than reap the riches from their land, many of the communities that lived there often became instead a source of riches for others, a people to plunder. You know, take places like Cars Beach, which today is up here in the upper left-hand corner. It's today known as the Villages of Chesapeake Harbor, a gated community with high-end condos surrounding the marina, where people have to swipe a card to get an entrance. You know, this is today some of the most valuable real estate in the Mid-Atlantic region. And the descendants of Frederick Carr, the original owner, never saw a dime of it. Take the seaside property that was owned by the Freeman family in North Carolina, which I wrote about. Formerly home to the summer community Seabreeze and the beach resort that was affectionately known as Bop City, a place that was re reputed to have given birth to the popular dance known as the Shag, one that was fittingly appropriated by white teenagers and made even more popular in the 50s. That's another story. <laughs> this too was lost to an heir's property partition sale in 2008. Family members left with very little except memories. Or take the case of American Beach in Florida, one of the most celebrated black beach resorts in the South. Today, a fraction of its original size, surrounded on both sides by plantation resorts. Its few remaining families struggling to hold on and to keep the others from selling out and to hold off county officials who were constantly scheming for new ways to maximize the wealth generating potential of the land. You know, this is the threat that historic communities here, like Sag Harbor Hills, and Asgares, and Niva, Nin Nineveh. 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 I always, I'm sorry, I always mispronounce the name Nineveh. Nineveh. Um, in many respects, though, it's a threat that we all face today. Mm -hmm. It's the threat of, of a capitalism that is kind of freed from any constraints or of any conscience. Mm -hmm. A capitalism that sees places as just commodities, whose value might yet fully be realized, is heedless of the path of destruction to people and to the land itself that is left in its wake. You know, throughout American history, African Americans have become intimately familiar with capitalism's most exploitative and oppressive features. They've also consistently been witness to new threats on the horizon. We saw this most recently during the housing foreclosure crisis which struck black America years before it consumed the global economy. In that respect, we can look at African American history as the canary in the coal mine, alerting us to dangers that threaten us all. The threat facing black beach resorts today is a threat we all ultimately must face. It's a threat rooted in this insatiable desire among today's super rich, the 1%, if you will, for new sources of profit, new land to conquer, new places to commodify, new consumers to tap. It's in many respects a reflection of our vastly unequal society and these gross disparities in power and political influence that follow from it, which has allowed the winners in this vicious game to claim all of the spoils, including all the desirable land, often to the exclusion of everyone else and to often act as if the rules that govern society and nature don't apply to them. In many, way, in many respects, this is the story of coastal America over the last 50 years. But it doesn't have to be our future. And if anything, I hope that my writing of the history of these places will alert us to these dangers that we all face in this, our second Gilded Age, and Black America's second nadir and give us that sense of urgency that we need to push back, and the knowledge to know what we're up against. So with that, I thank you, and I look forward to welcome your questions.
I, I don't always I'm rushing. He never did a really proper introduction. He's an associate professor at the Virginia University of Virginia, UVA, and uh, he's written now two books. And I know this, the first book received an award. What was the award again? Historian award. That was a. Uh the Organization of American Historians for right. so, the best book in civil rights history. So. Right, so this is uh, the first book of the last one to see that um, The second book, I believe, is outside and yes. available for sales. And uh, we'll talk about the arrangements at the end, but basically he's going to be available to not only sign, but also <laughs> handle and sell and work out the different Yes, and, then if, um, and there's also, if you're unable to, um, Purchase one today. We also have flyers out there that include a uh, special code that you can get a discount when you purchase online. So right. yeah. terrific. So you'll see that afterwards. Okay. So let me kick off uh, with a question. Well, before we do that, I want to give um, Julian an opportunity to talk about the DOE. So this is Julian Adams. Julian, can you explain to the audience the letter that we received, which is the designated um, the DOE? Explain to the audience what that letter is for us. Yes. Good afternoon. Yeah, yeah we work a lot of acronyms in my field. <laughs> we have an entire conversation about using actual words. And the DOE means determination of eligibility. Our office is the State Historic Preservation Office that manages all the state and federal historic preservation programs, which one of them is what you may know of as the National Register of Historic Places, which is the nation's official list of uh, sites, artifacts, neighborhoods, buildings, uh, objects, a lot of the description of things there. They're important at local, state, or national history. And there's a process that we go through to make that determination. First of all, is through a survey of historic resources, because we may not know what's out there, or what's out there may not be fully understood. And usually we start with either a locally sponsored, or a state sponsored, or otherwise sponsored survey of an area. And the survey was undertaken of the Sands community, basically seeing what's out there, the history of it, the physical description of it, the buildings, the sites, the location, everything about that, the story that's told, not only in the site and its history, but the buildings that remain. And by that, we look and say, does this area this collection of resources and its history meet the criteria for National Register listing. And when we say that, that is the DOE. And we have officially, as a New York State Historic Preservation Office, given the SANS community a determination of eligibility to the National Register. Now what that means is a next step will take place where we formally nominate that uh, survey, the area that's been surveyed, to the National Register. And that's our next step. I was talking strategy just before we got started with Andrew's lecture. Um, with a few people here that I'm enthusiastic about it. I'm dedicating my office to move ahead as quickly as possible, work with the local sponsors as much as possible. Because once that national designation is officially given, it passes a review by our office, and we have a gubernatorially appointed state review board that makes that decision. My staff presents it to the board. Our commissioner signs it, which makes it on the state register of historic places. Then we formally present it to the federal government, and the National Register, the keeper of the National Register in Washington, signs off and puts it officially on the National Register of Historic Places. What that is for us is a full understanding and formal documentation and determination that this location, this neighborhood, is important in local, state, and national history. We need to choose the level, and we're going to choose national history level for the San Jose because we're really it's such a rare anxiety that we're a rare survivor. It's such an important record of the African American community here in Long Island um, and has national significance for us. So we're hoping to move that forward pretty soon. Um, we're also hoping by that effort to raise the profile of SANS, not only at the national state level, also at the local level, as something worthy of careful treatment and careful preservation. So Andrew, uh, we saw your book and uh, know a little bit about your background, but I don't think most people here know. And one of the questions I have to kick off is, how did you get in the business of, history, of being a historian, and in particular, the subject matter of place? Well, I've always been, uh, I always thought, I'd, I think I knew I always wanted to become a historian, but I also had a strong desire, continue to have a strong desire to do history that matters and that speaks directly to the challenges we face today, um, and offers lessons that we need going forward. Um, and I'm also guided by the, the, the belief that African American history is American history, and it's essential to understanding the situation. And since you know, one side sort of began, 
um, to learn about the historic struggles and experience of African Americans, um, of the history of racism in America. That whole previous history I had learned, the white history, didn't make any sense anymore. But it certainly needed to be fundamentally um, revised. And so I see this as part of that larger project. But in particular with this story, I think the understanding the origins and resiliency and then more recent struggles of many historic Black Beach communities really opens a window onto some of the challenges we face um, as we grow increasingly unequal as a society and also as we continue to see sort of land use uh, property ownership playing such an instrumental role in this landscape of opportunity in America that um, home ownership and the denial of home ownership to that post-World War II generation of African Americans um, played such a pivotal role in exacerbating inequality uh, for generations to come and providing so many ladders of opportunity to white Americans um, that were denied to others. And this sort of speaks to that history, but it also speaks to the ways that African Americans um, resisted and pushed back against that. Again, I think, you know, seeing here and hearing the stories, especially over the last day since I've been here, of the way that homes were being built, used quite literally with people's own hands, not the help of mortgage lenders and of the banks and all the other assets that were available. That's something that is incredibly inspiring and also something that offers us lessons for understanding why these places matter, their histories need to be celebrated, and, and we need to learn something from them. And I've really gained a powerful sense of that, not just here, but over the past several years as I've gone and sat on front porches in places like Highland Beach, or gone down and, and saw just the heartbreak of of African Americans who lived along the Gulf Coast after Katrina. Um, you know, Katrina wiped out what remained of Gulf Side, and it was um, so heartbreaking to just see, and also to know that they weren't going to get any help from the state. You know, I mean, they weren't going to, there was, it, was, it really took, you know, it, there was not going to be any concerted efforts to help this community. They were on their own, and in a sense, um, they needed their histories told and amplified um, beyond just simply the community itself. And so I think, if anything, telling these histories and linking them to these larger issues that we face today um, can play a key role in the very sort of um, efforts and initiatives we're seeing happening here and seeing um, the progress being made on. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I have one over here, too, when you're okay. Uh, first of all, Andrew, I think you've uh, been very successful in putting, uh, encapsulizing quite a history. And uh, it's sobering to me, and, and I'm sure many of the other people who are attending here. Um, we have some of the challenges, many of the challenges that were mentioned uh, in your presentation. The question becomes, can you identify any communities who are successful and defending themselves, and what sort of techniques they used. Yeah, um, and actually, I, uh, one place that has been able to remain resilient and maintain over many generations their um, sort of community identity, even as they welcome in new members, is Highland Beach in Maryland, um, a place whose history is very similar to Sag Harbor's. Uh, both in its origins, um, its development, and as I've come to learn over the last day, many of the families who live in Highland Beach also have connections to many of the families living here in Sag Harbor. And, and Highland Beach really not just clung to their historic significance, but made a point of making public officials aware of it. Uh, for one, you know, right there at the centerpiece of Highland Beach's uh, summer community was the house that was built for Frederick Douglass uh, by his children that he um, tried, you know, unfortunately died before he ever had a chance to occupy, but it was uh, designated as a historic landmark. Um, it's, its history sort of marks the identity of that place and, and, and it helps sort of give those who live within Highland Beach um, a sense of purpose in helping to ensure that they're not gonna sort of be picked off lot by lot, one by one. Um, and it also really sort of marks for developers a sense of do you want to be do you want to be the person who um, destroys the community that was uh, founded by you know, the children of Frederick Douglass. 
Um, and it says that's at least from talking to folks who live in that community, they say that um, it's both sort of invested um, their community with a larger sense of purpose, but also really signal to local and state officials, you know, that, that not to mess with this, not to sort of just treat it like any other piece of real estate because it's more than that. Um, so I think his, in this sense, we really see directly why history matters and how history can be an, an instrument of protecting, preserving, and enhancing those very features that made these communities so special and makes them so, um, so in need of protection in, the, in this sense. So that's one example I would give, I think, that is perhaps most directly relevant to what um, you were facing here in Sag Harbor, which is you know, how history and telling that history and, make sure, and making sure that those who need to hear that history hear it early and often by showing up at meetings uh, and going to those zoning board meetings where the critical decisions that will affect the future of a community are being made, city council meetings. These are places um, where you know, local politics um, can play a very pivotal role and also local history can be a tool not just for sort of telling stories but also helping to shape the future ahead. If I can ask just a follow-up question to what yeah. you're saying, um, just for context. If you were to estimate how many similar beaches existed over the history, American history time, how many may have existed and how many exist today? Sure. You know, it's, it, I, every, every almost, you know, not a month goes by where I don't um, come across another um, Black Beach Resort or other sort of vacation community that sprung up for a period of time, I, I would say it's well, well over a hundred um, that existed at various points. And again, places that were some in very prominent locations like here on Long Island, many others on remote rivers and lakes. Uh, I, I previously taught in Wisconsin and learned that there were several uh, black vacation communities that were uh, situated on lakes um, in the state's interior. Um, on many, so in a sense, it's almost, um, I have, I have not come with a sort of hard estimate, and I, I think I, even if I ever did, I would probably have to revise it um, in short order. Uh, I think one of the sort of things that's really hard me is, is how in the, in the years since my book first came out, how many other historians um, and members of the public have sort of picked up the torch and continued to investigate this subject and kind of come across so many more examples that I um, did not foresee. <laughs> But I would say, you know, the, uh, the number of places, that, again, that really have been able to not just sort of maintain the name, but also um, a sort of direct lineage to the past are, are very few today. And I think, you know, this is one, um, as, along with Highland Beach, along with the communities at Oak Blossom, Martha's Vineyard, but um, many of them, if they exist in name only, um, some of them exist in name only, and others have been completely um, wiped off the map. And I think that that's something that um, documenting these histories and ensuring that those places um, whose histories are still um, you know, ongoing can um, be able to capture and then help um, preserve that. Okay, we have another question over here. But just to follow up with your question previous, is we have, one of the things that we can pride ourselves as a community, we have um, been very present um, in many levels, whether it's board meetings, whether it's ARB meetings, whether we continue to hold up the torch with uh, making sure that our history is known, whether it's through the historical societies, through it's the developmental meetings, the associated meetings, we have continued to do that. So we have the advantage of having a sense and strong sense of history in the region. Yeah. So that is the advantage that we do have. Absolutely. And besides beachside communities, I've been seeing the exact same thing happening, for example, in Councilman Jumani Williams' neighborhood in Brooklyn. He's fighting the exact same thing. And I've been suggesting to him that two things need to be done. One is define the phrase character of a neighborhood. Everyone talks about protecting the character of the neighborhood, but it's not defined. And the other thing is eliminate uh, real estate development money from uh, campaigns right. and campaign revival. Yeah. Is there a question? <laughs> okay, so we are taking yes questions. And yes and yes. So if you have a question, let us know. Uh, there's one over here. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Stephen Roach. I'm the president of the Minimum Association of the Historic and Black Communities, as we know. Um, I think one of the issues that we've been facing is really is, comes down to not the fact that we all are not aware of the historical nature of our communities. I think it comes down to the individual family question that I've seen time and time again of siblings 
uh, you know, apparent eyes, et cetera, and the question becomes when you're presented with two, three, five million dollars for a property that your parents or grandparents got for fifteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and then you, you know, you have members of your family who are spread in California and North Carolina and you know throughout the country, then it becomes the question of how do you retain that property at that point mm -hmm. to see the appreciation. The rapid appreciation, not just in the African American communities, but also in the town of St. Paul, that people are facing, mm -hmm. and how to retain that legacy with that. So my question is, how do you go about doing that when you have these families who have sibling issues, questions, et cetera, et cetera? It's very difficult. Yes, I think for one, uh, when you when you talk about the examples of, of the families who are getting ungodly amounts of money flashed before them by uh, would-be developers. I mean, that, there's larger structural forces at play here that um, in many ways can't simply be solved at the local level. And I think you know, we've seen here what is happening here and is happening across America is a byproduct of the vast concentration of wealth um, in the hands of a few and the way that that sort of um, wealth has sort of really been able to wield influence in ways um, that has been detrimental to uh, community ties. So in that sense, you sort of, that requires a macro approach to sort of work for social change on a broad number of levels and um, to begin to address some of the profound inequalities um, and inequities um, in American society more broadly. But with regards to sort of how do, you, how do you ensure that a family that wants to stay or is maybe, um, you know, ambivalent about the question of maintaining ownership, especially in the face of this intense pressure that many of them often face from, from developers um, and public officials. I think we need, there are approaches that can be taken to ensure that that um, decision is not going to be simply made out of um, sort of a lack of options. And I think one in particular, again, as I discussed earlier, how the role that property taxes have and continue to play to sort of force the hand of families um, who might want to hold on to property but feels that they're almost forced to sell because they can simply not afford um, to make to continue to pay property taxes that are um, going through the roof. There's way those are those are there are many approaches that can be taken to ensuring that um, caps are placed on on taxes um, for families depending on how long they've lived there, the age of the owners. These are these are policies that are in place um, in communities across the country that could be uh, adopted here. That's just one approach, again, that would say, would not remove the agency of any family who wishes to do with their property as they please, but ensure that that decision is, is being made without the sort of, um, is not being made under duress, I would say. Um, but I think, you know, again, there are, um, there are larger forces at play here that um, in some ways, in some respects, um, are bigger than um, any one community or homeowner, but nevertheless, you know, I, I think we can begin to approach these through a piecemeal way that ensures that families uh, are able to make a, a, a decision with a clear conscience. Uh, and I just want to add and take this question that uh, many in SANS have discussed this, and many in SANS, um, um, there are a lot of investment people in SANS. And so I know that there's some discussion of perhaps having sessions about wealth management and how do you hold on to your property, particularly the next generations, how to do that. So that's more to come. We don't, there's no easy answer, but it is doable. So the question is, do you want to sell your house for that one million or two million, have an investor come in and add another million to it, build a house, and then charge seven million to sell it? Because that's what's happening. Thanks, Renee. And Andrew, I'm going to continue uh, Steve's uh, this for, for your well-described detailed encapsulation. And, and what's happening in the SANS community is needs to be considered in the context of what's happening in Sac Harbor Village as, as a whole. Mm -hmm. Because historically, that's been a blue-collar town, often characterized as a, a town with a, a, a drinking town with a fishing problem. But they were really <laughs> the service community for East Hampton, Bridgehampton, uh, Southampton, south of, of Route 27. And my wife and I, we've had notes posted on our front door, people saying they wanted to buy our house. And I think, I mean, the money's there, and there are a lot of different tactics that you've described in to buy out or push out with, with real estate taxes. But I think as a community, we have to think what's the cost ultimately. I'm reminded of, of Fanon's book, uh, Black Skin, White Masks, 
This is the one place where the mask would come off as we were growing up and we could spend our summers out here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the value of that, at least for me personally, transcends any dollar transaction that, that, that might occur. So I, I think we need to think about that as, as, as a community uh, because there are larger forces at, at play as, as, as you demonstrate. So as we go forward, the community is not going to look the same. We might not even have the same sense of community, but there's going to be, we're very resilient folks. So there's going to be a core of people that have tried to the best of our ability to maintain that. And I think one thing we should take to heart is being actively engaged, not then in the zoning board, we're going to get into the politics of the city council, the mayoral race, whatever opportunities we have to, to influence yeah. what's going to happen. Yeah, I would just add again, you know, all politics is local here. You know, that, that there are, there's a lot of action that can be taken uh, through engaging with local officials and engaging with each other. Again, a community isn't self-sustaining. It requires communal events, talking to each other, uh, and, and, decide, and realizing what do you truly value about a place. Um, and that comes through this sort of, and it, it, it doesn't happen overnight, it's built up over the course of generations. The sad thing is, is it can be torn apart really quickly um, without the sort of sustained involvement and engagement of community members and of, of events like this and of organizations such as SANS. I mean, these are, this is the glue that holds communities together and ensures that at the very least, um, it's not gonna go down without a fight. Right. When I greet people in the, in the morning, I say, I'm not moving. How are you doing this day? Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, one question, because um, I know we're historically black, but we're, we are um, world citizens, and a lot of us have family members who are not black, and, and we have neighbors who are not black, and we have in our first homes, you know, we're in areas that are a part of the United States of America, and so we have all types of friends and family. Someone who is not black, why is this important to them? And when you talk about um, African American history and African American history is part of American history, can you explain what that means? I get it in a sense because we tend to not realize how, how history is actually recorded and written and then in schools taught. So what, in that context, what does that mean? So I learned history, what are you saying? <laughs> okay. It's tough, to, it's tough to put into words in the sense that I, but I do believe that we as a country need to fully come to terms with and grasp the legacy of racism and how it has shaped all of our lives, uh, profoundly shaped white Americans' lives, um, and given, provided material and ideological advantages that continue to uh, shape our society. And, and, and also, I think, Again, when you begin to understand how, when you ask questions like, how does this economy really work? You're not gonna get that, a, a sort of clear sense of that by looking at the winners and those who extol its virtues. You get it by looking at people who've experienced it um, and perhaps it's less savory forms. And you can begin to sort of look at and understand the depths of problems we face. Again, I come back continually to the issue of, of what the most recent calamity, um, the housing foreclosure crisis which if you were witnessing what was happening in black American um, communities um, in the, as early as the early 2000s, you would see that something was not right here. There was a rot at the core of what was transpiring. But then if you turned on CNBC or you know, read, or read just like the New York Times or Wall Street Journal, you'd think everything was going great. And then suddenly um, we have a crisis on our hands. I think you know, that is just one example, I think, of ways in which we can begin to understand how um, you know, some of the sort of problems that we face as a collectively as a society through looking at the experiences of African Americans and looking in particular at the role that race continues to play in shaping the landscape of opportunity in America. Now, I think as well, in particular, you know, here, what, what does this history, the history of, of, of these communities here in Sag Harbor have to teach all of us? Again, I think it forces us to look and understand um, what, what makes a community and what, is, what do we um, value in a community? I think one thing that really troubles me here, and again, I think that sort of, you know, this, we need to push back against the notion that um, 
that this is a fight about you know, change versus preservation. I mean, change is inevitable. The question is, is what type of change is going to take place, and, and who's going to benefit from it, and what's going to be lost. And, I, and one of the things that really disturbed me when I, and I, I saw that I see this here, and I've seen it um, across coastal America, is the type of change that takes place is one, especially if you see new homeowners move in who don't want to become a part of the community, right. who oftentimes build walls around their properties, mm -hmm. um, especially you know along the beach. You know, beaches. I think beaches are a perfect window. I've written two books about beaches now, and uh, I think they're a really important window into sort of how we how we live our lives and what we value and how we interact with each other. Because you see. Again, beaches are legally common property that should belong to all of us. And we sort of have a sense of beaches as spaces where people can come together. But yet, um, we see it, especially in more recent years, we're seeing the um, increased privatization of shorelines, putting up walls and barriers and gates to close ourselves off. And how, that really has a corrosive effect on society. And to be quite frank, oftentimes, those walls are being built with racist Sort of underlying motives behind them. And certainly historically, um, many of the sort of forms of, of segregation and exclusion we see along shorelines is, is rooted in uh, race. And again, that's where we can begin to see how this history um, really affects all of us and how we can really take lessons from it in finding a way forward. And so, are there any other questions? This one over here. And then I'll get you, Bill. It was a question that someone wanted to ask, but they didn't want to ask it um, personally, but um, I'll just pose it to you. Um, they said that there were codes that were currently on the books that were being broken. Like there are rules that we know of and that they, the, the village doesn't abide by. How do you combat that? And can they combat that? You know, um, there, there are some things that have been done. Yeah. And, and of course, we, we had this conversation yesterday that they know they just they rather just do it and pay the fine. You know, they rather do it and apologize. That whole syndrome. How do you combat that? We all know that this has been happening. Mm -hmm. So that was the question that they had. I, I mean, again, I think we we can draw a direct a direct comparison to what you're describing here to the way that um, any financial institutions and corporations operate. They would, you know, they flagrantly violate rules and full knowledge that they'll get a slap on the wrist, um, just have to pay a fine, which again is a drop in the bucket oftentimes. So they you know, they do the cold hard calculation and say, hey, it's worth it to just go ahead and ignore these local laws, um, you know, rush right ahead, and we'll find a way out of it, or at least we'll use our power and influence to lessen the blow. Uh, so that, again, requires policy solutions. It requires changes in the law to make the, um, the consequences for violating these codes um, you know, strong enough that actually it will deter people from, from doing things that are oftentimes, and I think, again, what we're seeing here, especially on the shoreline, is a real clear, clear examples of how many of these practices that seek to sort of, uh, to, that seek to uh, privatize or close off space uh, are not just antisocial, but are also very damaging to the environment. And often those two go hand in hand. And so these are uh, <coughs> ways, that, again, that we need to find ways to make the laws strong enough to deter these actions. Because clearly right now, many have concluded that it's worth it to just break the law and deal with um, the fallout later. Um, we need to find ways to make that not the case. Hi, this is more just of a clarification uh, question. You had a lot of graphics. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if, for the black land ownership, if it was just for shoreline or if it was um, also for the Yes, in general, no. So the uh, the graph that I showed earlier that showed that the extent of black land ownership in America includes all acreage. Um, mm. But it's important to note that, that, that from the early 20th century, if you looked at the geographical distribution of black land ownership in America, there was a surprising, remarkable amount of that land ownership that was concentrated in coastal areas. And if you go think about it, at the time, in the early 20th century, many coastal areas were not seen as very valuable or desirable property. In many ways, many African Americans were able to acquire vast amounts of acreage along the Atlantic coastline and, and carve out a measure of, of independence
white fragility. And it talks about this sort of problem of how whenever a discussion of race comes up, whites just sort of start panicking and they say, I don't want to talk about it. And, and again, I think it's a reflection of a sort of um, a much longer history that uh, many, many whites want to avoid addressing because it forces them to address uncomfortable questions about the privileges and advantages they enjoy today. And um, I think if you are a person of, you know, a person who does believe um, that we need to have these conversations and address them, then you need to be doing it every day and not in any way sort of um, you know, tiptoe around these subject matters. And I think, again, racism is a problem of white people. And it's, again, it's not, this is a problem that white Americans um, need to um, tackle head on. And I think you know, racial inequality today is a legacy of the actions of my ancestors. And um, that, I think, is something that we need to continually um, address and if you, um, if you do care about it as a white person, you can't just sort of you know, be content and say, well, I know I'm a good person. I think <laughs> you have to take action. It's not self-enforcing. And so, um, so again, my, my capacity is just to Before I get to Bill, um, one question we talked about a little bit in the car um, uh, come over, which was, we're talking about what is happening to the coastline and, and uh, um, African American ownership of land. Um, but dynamics are economic in many respects, and people who are not black are suffering from that. I know in Sag Harbor, um, I know that there are a lot of Sag Harbor know that we have pressure on, is it Redwood has pressure, um, the village has pressure, there's pressure all over that's very similar. And um, my, what we talked about is trying to explain that this is, the dynamics are able in a bowling, in, this is, I'm making this up in the sense that, you know, in a bowling alley, you can knock the first couple levels off with your bowling ball, they are still, the ball is still going. And it's on to the next level, which will include the other buildings in Redwood and other areas. This is just the tip of, of the iceberg, and I, I will say something that someone who's a lawyer said to me, who is not black, said the reason they're coming after you is because they see you as the weakest link, link that there's more likely that they'll be able to come in here for generational reasons. And I heard a quote, I won't say where the quote came from, other than the person said, oh, we can wait this out because sons and daughters don't want to stay. Think about that. So, and can this be the last question because we have to uh, do the book signing and then we, you don't have to go home, but we have to leave here. So this is the last question. And then we... Last question back here. Okay. Yes, okay. and then... I Hello, Andrew. Uh, I am not a soul loser, and I damn sure don't want to be a sure loser. <laughs> uh, we have people moving into our community who put up evergreens to be never seen. Uh, and that uh, is against the sense of community that we've developed and, and that adore, uh, that makes it so special. Uh, we are not a commodity, we are a community. Mm -hmm. And they treat us as if we're just a buy and sell operation. Uh, we have to put a stop to that or at least slow it down. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been here a long time. I spent most of my life in Sac Harbor. I've grown up with everybody in this community. Uh, and I like it and I want to stay. But the economic uh, imperatives are so overwhelming uh, that uh, they think everybody's for sale. Uh, we have to button up, tighten up, and straighten up. That's all I got to say. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, I think it requires us to have a more fundamental conversation about what we value as a society. We have become, uh, in many respects, one that uh, we have become so wedded to this market fundamentalism, this idea that the open market will determine um, you know, everything. And it's, and, it's, and it's been destructive on so many levels, and it's, and it's really eroded the fabric of our communities and has distorted our values to the point where now um, we find ourselves in situations where, again, I would say, that as, 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 as Renee pointed out earlier, this is happening first to black American communities, but it's not going to end there. And I think that we are seeing you know, that the path of least resistance continues on, and we have to find ways to resist it and push back 
because again, this is not this is something that is threatening so many different areas of our lives, um, and not and, and beyond just simply issues of housing and, and real estate development, but really reaches into uh, many different areas of our culture and society in, in destructive ways. Uh, and so it requires a sort of discussion about what we mean when we talk about community um, and what what do we value in community, uh, and that's something that. Um, goes beyond, but is very much rooted in the problems we're facing here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Noel Hankin, Nineveh Beach. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. I have a very specific question. Uh, I want to share my observation first. When you look at what's driving the turnover of uh, home ownership in our neighborhood, it is economics. And what I see is that when developers come in and build four, five, six thousand square foot homes with six, seven bedrooms and three, four car garages, uh, I know property taxes are going to go up every year. What that does is dramatically, geometrically increase property taxes. And yet, what I notice is that there's a great deal of ennui and uh, lethargic attitudes toward big houses. Some people have the attitude, well, it's their land, they can do what they want. It affects you. And there seems to be a very low level of recognition that when these big houses go up, it's going to force people out. And it's a direct correlation. It might take two years, three years, but I'd like to know if you agree and if that's what you've seen. I heard it's a 10-year plan. <laughs> ten oh, years. it's a 10-year plan. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. History shows that the, 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 the no piece of property, that, that any piece of property at, at, that goes down this path is going to have ripple effects that extend far and wide. Uh, and the, property taxes is the most direct example of where you see the influence that large scale development can have on surrounding areas. But, but it, it goes beyond just even economics. It is certainly rooted in these economic calculations, but it also goes to uh, the question of, of you know, what is a community? Do, uh, are, are, these types of homes being built and brought in um, conducive to maintaining uh, and enhancing those features that make a community what it is. And, and those, um, and, and history again shows that it often works toward um, isolation, fragmentation, um, hostility. I mean, you see you know, the growth of you know, gates, security guards, other things that are meant to sort of really, um, that work against the interest of actually having uh, people come together. and. Yes, I mean, I think that you know, while there's certainly a long tradition of respecting property rights, there's also a long tradition of, of land use regulations in this country. Um, and in fact, land use regulations have often been used to the detriment of black Americans, but these same tools can be used to help ensure that um, the types of developments that, that a community doesn't want won't come there. And I think, you know, again, that requires local engagement in politics and working um, through local channels and using the law to your advantage in these instances. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I share my questions, uh, next steps, we always believe in next steps, so what are we going to be doing from here? Um, we're not over with this. As was mentioned uh, already, that there's a filing and a nomination and stuff, but we also want to give more information. I don't have a date, but Allison, if you could just stand up a second. Allison did a Herculean job pulling together a 60-page plus historic survey that documents what happened in um, Sands and a 130-page, you know, with each house chronicled and background, et cetera, et cetera. We are looking to schedule a time where Allison will make a presentation of the survey so you can get a sense of the further beginnings and where things are. We had a beginning with two African American females who rented here in the 40s in Eastville and on um, one of the, I'm mean, just been black, on the street that goes up 114. I'm with black. All right, anyway, so Amaza, Meredith, and Maud uh, Terry, and they started it in As Arrest. Two African Americans, so those who are women here, you know, two African American women walked across the street and they said, What is this all this land here? and would it be available? And because of economics, the owners sold because Santa Carver was going through an economic slump post-war. And many people don't realize it, but the inclusion of this development
help the tax base of Sag Harbor and the retail stores of Sag Harbor. You know, they may not have loved selling it to us, but it helped them economically during those very tough post-war periods. So I just want to give you a little tease because Allison has the full story and we'll be presenting it at some time that we can accommodate her schedule and our schedule. So look forward to that. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you. 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 Thank you.